Welcome back to the session. Uh, today, we're going to do a review of central nervous system anatomy, CNS system. And this session won't cover everything in the central nervous system, of course, because that would be a lot to cover. But it's going to be just a little bit of a review. So let's go through it. Oh, there we go. So we'll start off with embryology, because that's how we always start. How does everything begin with? So when there is an embryo and it's growing inside the uterus, we start off with something called the neural plate. Um, as you can see, it looks a bit like a plate. So we've got two ends. We've got the caudal, um, the cephalic end and the caudal end or the brain end and the spinal cord end. Um, and in terms of the groove, as we can see, there's a little cross section and there's three important layers that we should think about. So we've got our ectoderm on the top, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. And as you can see, at about day 18, a specialized group of cells, I guess called the notochord, is going to stimulate that ectoderm, that green part of the ectoderm, to kind of induce folding. So it's going to tell it to stay, hey, it's time to now start folding. We need to start making the neural structures for the body. So the ectoderm, as you can see on day 20, is going to start to descend down, creating like a groove. So as you can see, it's called the neural groove, and it looks very similar to a groove, and the top's going to be called a crest. Now, on day 22, this groove then fuses together to form our central canal, and the ectoderm kind of sits on the top. So the whole little part over here, this pocket kind of invaginates itself into the, um, into the structure and forms our central canal. And a specialized group of cells called our neural crest cells are gonna be sitting, also gonna come out of, from these crest. So what used to be the neural crest, they're also gonna come out. And there's gonna be some neural crest cells as well. So neural crest cells are responsible, then will specialize later on in development to perform Schwann cells, meninges, endocardial cushions, parafollicular cells, and the, the adrenal medulla as well, and a whole lots of um, specialized functions for each things. So now once we have our central canal, this is then going to be our spinal cord and our brain that's going to further develop so you can see there's a brain end and there's the spinal cord end so on about day 25 the cranial end will start to fuse and then once it starts fusing this brain part the the caudal the cranial end of this tube is then going to turn into different sorts of vesicles i'm going to see that in the next slide so once it starts closing it's gonna say, all right, it's time to start making our specialized parts of the brain. Then about day 27, this is when our, the ca caudal end of the tube is gonna fuse. Failure of the cranial end to fuse would end up in a condition called anencephaly, which is incompatible with life, while failure of the closure of the um, caudal end of the tube will end up with spina bifida, and a lot of these patients, some of them may have no symptoms at all, while others may have neurological deficits as well. On the side, you can just see they're just talking about the ectoderm. So they're just looking at the ectoderm. As you can see, the notochord, which is, hasn't been shown here, is going to tell this neural plate to start to fold inwards, creating a neural fold. And then again, make that neural tube-like structure. And all these little, what used to be the neural crest is going to break off into neural crest cells. All righty. So remember how we said when the brain end of the neural tube is going to close, three primary vesicles will form. And then from these three primary vesicles, we can have secondary vesicles. So let's talk about our three main primary vesicles. You've got your proencephalon, mesencephalon, romencephalon. So your proencephalon is going to then form your telencephalon and diencephalon. So you can think of it like your the T 
telon or we'll talk about it in the next slide but it looks very similar to a telescope and that's how i remember telencephalon is our top one this will then further differentiate later on to our cerebral hemisphere our basal ganglia lateral ventricles so our higher up structures our diencephalon is our thalamus our hypothalamus and our third ventricle then we've got our midbrain the mesencephalon this will then later go into our midbrain and then our hindbrain so the end part of the romencephalon will then go into our metencephalon so our pons our cerebrum uh, the upper part of the fourth ventricle sorry that should say cerebellum and then our myelencephalon so our medulla and our lower part of our fourth ventricle so i know there's a lot of words but it always makes sense to kind of look at the picture side of it so you remember you got our three primary vesicles so remember our proencephalon, mesencephalon, romencephalon. And pro is like upper, so you can think of it as upper. Meson is M for middle. And romencephalon, it's kind of the last, it's like kind of the last letters of the alphabet. So it's, it's sitting on the bottom and you got your spinal cord. So as you can see, our proencephalon goes into two different parts. It goes into our telencephalon. Diencephalon. So can you see kind of looks like binoculars sort of so that's how i think of it as a telescope and the second part diencephalon so this is responsible for your thalamus your hypothalamus i think of it like princess diana very important kind of structures you got your thalamus your hypothalamus controlling your whole body royal family that sort of thing and then we've got your mesencephalon so this, this is your midbrain very easy to remember. It doesn't change at all. It doesn't get into any secondary vesicles at all. It stays exactly the same. And then your romencephalon will turn into your pons, meta, and myelencephalon. So M-E-T, M-Y-E. So can you see there in alphabetical order? Very easy to remember. Your pons go higher than your medulla. Then you got your spinal cord. It's important to note that this is not really a straight light structure. It actually looks very similar to this. So in terms of structure wise it's a nice diagram to kind of represent that in and again just highlights the structures that we've discussed over here and it also talks a little bit about the flexures that are present so if this is our pons this is going to be a pontine flexure same with here's our cephalic part of the brain so this is also called the cephalic flexure um, and then the cervical flexure which this will be a cervical kind of spinal cord area but the more important thing is remembering the primary vesicles and the secondary vesicles as well. Now I'll talk about a ventricular system. So there is a system in our brain that carries um, something called CSF. Um, CSF fluid is very important. CSF fluid is very important to kind of, um, it's a, it has a protective function as well. Um, and it kind of helps store the brain and prevents shock damage and it has a whole lot of specialized functions as well so it's some fluid that circulates and covers around the brain so I'll talk about where it kind of originates and so there is something called the ventricles in the middle of the brain we've got here's our diagram with our lateral ventricles on the sides you've got your third ventricle in the middle and it goes down to your fourth ventricle You've got your choroid plexuses that are present in the walls of the ventricles in your third and your lateral and your fourth. So you, these are responsible for producing a CSF. And as you can see, it flows down the system. Blockages in the system can lead to an abnormal pathological accumulation of this fluid. And then um, this needs to be drained or treatments need to be initiated at that point um, so next one as you can see there's also a little um, passageway so this is called the frame in a monroe this is called the cerebral aqueduct and then it of course exits into our spinal cord and subarachnoid space i want to see a little bit more of that so again what is it produced by a choroid plexus so choroid plexus is kind of a mix of pyre capillaries and epidymal cells in the wall of the ventricles. They produce about 20 milliliters per hour um, and it has a volume of 120 milliliters in adults. So as you can see, it produced flows right down 
And once it flows down, it can exit through a certain number of ways. It can go through the lateral apertures, also known as the foramen of laksha, lateral laksha, LL, or it can actually go out through the median aperture. Um, and this is called the foramen of Majendi. So Majendi, median, MM, nice and easy to remember. CSF is then absorbed. So we're producing all the CSF. We need to kind of get rid of it as well because it's producing it at a constant rate. So we need to get rid of it. It needs to circulate through a system. And that is to, because of the arachnoid granulations. And we'll see about that more in the next slide. Let me see. I think we've covered everything on this slide. So here we've got our cerebroventricular system. As you can see, the CSF flows down our system. And then here we've got a few exit systems. So it can go exit down and continue circulating the spinal cord. Some of it can actually continuously go through the central canal of the spinal cord. And some of them go up around the cerebellum. And again, all of them kind of go end up around this area. Now, this is what the arachnoid granulations are. These are continuations of the CSF. Um, it has contact with the superior sagittal sinus, so a venous system. So what it does is it can exit through the system into our venous system, and this will drain into our systemic circulation, and then it's re-circulated um, through the body. It's important to note that in some of these spaces, the CSF has a lot of pockets where there's a, li a little bit more fluid than we expect, right? These are called cisterns. So very, some important cisterns to kind of note is, so you've got your chiasmatic cistern, um, you've got your interpenduncular cistern, um, you've got your prepontine cistern over here, your cerebromedullary cistern, or also called the cisterna majana, ma magna, sorry. Uh, I've always called it the other one. So, And the last one is there's one called the quadrigeminal cistern as well. So these are important in terms of landmarks when we're looking through CT scans or investigations. So important to note these uh, different areas as well as they show up. Cool. And yeah, so next slide is we're going to now talk about our brain itself. So in terms of our brain, we've got major lobes. We've got our frontal lobe in the front. Frontal lobe, very makes sense. Parietal lobe, the occipital lobe on the back. So this is responsible for our vision. And our temporal lobe over here. You got your cerebellum underneath. And this is your brain stem. This diagram I've put to note down kind of key features of the brain. So you've got, can you see that line down the middle? That will be called your central sulcus. You've got your lateral sulcus over here, as you can see, very characteristic. So sulcuses are kind of grooves and um, the bumps are guy rise. So every time there's a line or like a groove, that's called a sulcus. Now important kind of landmarks, the front part's gonna be called the frontal pole. They haven't noted it here, but this will be called the occipital pole. And this part is going to be called a temporal pole. So three kind of main poles to remember. So again, here I've wanted to highlight the importance of different sulci. So you've got your central sulcus running right down the middle. Oh, sorry, the central sulcus is down the side. This will be called the longitudinal fissure, sorry. And the central sulcus will be running right down through here. And that's very characteristic. We can see that line down the middle. So in front of it, we've got your precentral gyrus. And behind it, you've got your postcentral gyrus. Your precentral gyrus is very important for a lot of your motor um, functions in your body. And your, the one behind it, your postcentral gyrus, will be responsible for a lot of your sensory kind of information. Another kind of important landmarks to note down is you've got here, you've got your temporal lobe. Due to these, you got your superior temporal sulcus, your middle temporal sulcus as well, very nice and easy to remember. And then that divides that into your superior temporal gyrus, because these are your bumps, your middle temporal gyrus, and your inferior temporal gyrus. Here's that kind of nice characteristic, the one we just talked about before, the lateral sulcus or the sylvian sulcus as well. And I think those are the main things to note down from these diagrams.
Alrighty. So you remember how we talked about your post precentral is for motor, post central is for sensory. So let's imagine if I slice it in half, but I'm gonna look at one side only. So let's just look at one of these sides. So if I had a slice from the precentral gyrus, um, we're gonna look at our motor. So it's gonna be the left and right are gonna be the same. That's why we only are looking at one of them because we would expect both of them to be the same. And here you can see it's like a geographical map kind of representing different areas of your body. So as you can see, a lot of our motor system in our brain is dedicated to our arms and our faces as well. So very important for our expression and our hand has a lot of function dedicated um, from the brain. And similarly for our somatosensory, so our post-central gyrus, Again, a lot of our sensation is actually dedicated to our facial area and especially lip area as well. So important to note that. So in our brain, we've got our, uh, also important thing to note in clinical significance is that different areas of the brain are supplied by different arteries. So when we have symptoms like a stroke, certain areas of deficit in terms of motor or sensory functions, tell us a little bit about what areas involved and in particular, what artery may be involved as well. So important in a clinical setting. So in terms of our brain, we've got our gray matter and our white matter. Gray is due to our cell bodies and our white matter is mainly representing the connections between different cell bodies. And because they're connection, um, nerve cells, they encapsulate a thing called myelin. And myelin gives off this characteristic white appearance. So in terms of our white matter, there are different types of white matter tracts. So there is projection fibers. So projection fibers connect the cere cerebrum to the rest of the body. Association fibers, so these connect different regions of the brain within the same hemisphere. It's not noted in this diagram, but imagine within the same side of the brain, so on the left side, maybe the frontal is connecting and discussing things to the temporal lobe. Um, and this can be long, which long association fibers are different lobes, like I've just mentioned before, the frontal to the temporal, or short. So these are just connecting within the same lobe not lob, lobe, but with different gyri. Commissural fibers is when there is connections between one side of the hemisphere to the other side of the hemisphere. So the left is talking to the right. And our biggest kind of pathway is the corpus callosum, as you can see in the yellow diagram over here as represented there. And this is responsible for talking from left to right. Other important other ways is the anterior and posterior commissures as well. So the red and blue diagram there. So here we've got a corpus callosum represented here. So this would, it's just a cross section. So it actually extends all the way down, as you can see over here. And it can be split into different parts as well. So you've got your rostrum at the front, then your genu. So genu is like, I think it represents knee. Um, and it looks a bit like a knee. You got your body, your ismith, and your splenium. So your brain stem. So this is going to be the bottom part of the brain, the stem of the brain. Midbrain, pons, medulla, three separate divisions. So let's talk about the midbrain. So the midbrain is the top part. Now the midbrain can be divided into two main areas. So you got your tectum and your tegmentum on the front. So tectum is over here, tegmentum is on the front. It's divided due to the cerebral aqueduct. So this is what divides that border. So in terms of the tectum, there is kind of bumps on the back and that's called colliculi. So it's gonna be a superior and inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi are responsible for auditory sorry, visual um, signals. So it can convert visual signals into eye movements and um, it has a very complex kind of relationship with that. 
and our inferior colliculus is responsible for gathering a lot of our auditory signals and is involved in integrating all of those together. So attachmentum can be, so that's our main kind of bulk over here, and that's responsible for coordination of movement, suppression of pain. So this is when, when you're in a very stressed situation, maybe you're in a car accident, you don't, you're not going to feel pain when you're in a car accident, after a car accident in that moment, because your body's full of adrenaline and a lot of sympathetic um, outflow and also the suppression of pain. And there, the system is involved with that. And also maintaining consciousness or alertness. So we're awake due to this tegmentum area as well. Cerebral peduncles are when it can, it's responsible for connecting the remainder of the brainstem to the thalamus, and this will go to the cerebral, so cerebral peduncles. Um, and it contains a lot of important tracts. So you've got your cortical spinal, your cortical pontine, your cortical bulbar tracts as well. So the main ones are your cross cerebri, that's your peduncles. So these connect all the way to your thalamus, and it contains a lot of these important tracts, as we've mentioned. It's separated from, I guess, the tegmentum area by the substantia nigra. And as you can see, they say the tegmentum contains the reticular formation, which is actually responsible for maintaining consciousness. Um, so I think these are the important kind of things to highlight in the midbrain. So in terms of our spinal cord now, so our spinal cord continues all the way down and something interesting happens after about L1 to L2. After L1 to L2, this is where the spinal cord technically ends. This is called the conus medullaris. Then there is a lot of fibers, which is called cord equina. Um, and these fibers then continue all the way down. And then you've got, this is where your subarachnoid space. So this is where our CSF kind of stops. And this is about S2 level. Then there is something that keeps continuing down. So there's something called the phylum terminalis, phylum terminal. And here, the phylum terminal is a pia slash dura. And we're going to talk about what pia and dura is in a certain moment but it is a thin like structure that anchors the spinal cord all the way to the coccyx. And it's to prevent kind of movement of the spinal cord within where it is. Um, and this ends all the way down. So as you can see, the CSF ends about S2 and the conus medullaris ends about L1 to L2. Now, when we, all these, um, all these CSF, so this is going to be CSF, but there's not going to be any spinal cord, right? There's going to be some um, quarter equina, so there are going to be fibers down here, running down here, as you can see. This will be quarter equina, but there's no spinal cord as such. Therefore, this is going to be called the lumbar cistern. As remember, cistern is a pool of CSF fluid, right? So this is a lumbar area, so a lumbar cistern. It's a perfect place to collect CSF fluid. So imagine you have a patient that you're suspecting meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges, layers of the spinal cord of the central nervous system. A good way to diagnose that a definitive um, investigation would be a CSF analysis or culture. So you need to collect a little bit of that CSF fluid now, very important that we don't stab a needle above here because we can hit the spinal cord. It's useless to stab a needle here where it's, there'll be no CSF fluid. So it's very important to know the anatomy. So since L1 to L2 is where it kind of ends, L3 to L4 is a very safe space um, to collect the CSF fluid then for analysis. Um, important things to note here is that the spinal cord has several enlargements. So you've got your cervical enlargement and also your lumbrosacral enlargement as well on the bottom. Um, so important to note there. So in terms of our spinal cord, so imagine here I've got a cross section of the spinal cord. I've cut it and I want to have a look at it. You've got your dorsal root and your ventral root. So your dorsal root is going to be important for sensory information. Ventral root is for motor. So as you can see, the dorsal root is going to be collecting information. 
and your ventral root is going to be sending off information for motor action. All right. And then this kind of meets here. So that there's a difference between dorsal root and dorsal ramus. So once here's our ganglion where it contains um, second order neurons and here they intertwine and mix uh, together. So a part of our motor is going to go to our dorsal ramus and a part of our sensory is going to go to dorsal ramus and the same goes for the ventral ramus. This dorsal ramus will then supply our dorsal aspect of our body. So it's going to supply the back and um, the back structures. So it might collect information from your back while your ventral ramus is going to send information to more of your ventral side or your anterior side. So collect sensory information or even send motor information to your abdominal muscles, let's say, or your chest or anything like that. So as you can see, ventral and dorsal side. This diagram here is to note, I think this one I wanted to highlight, there is, here is a spinal cord and there is a fold of um, dura mater or pia mater. So you've got your pia mater and it's going to be connected to your dura and arachnoid matter very firmly. And this is called the denticulate ligament. Similar to the phylum terminalis, remember that connects all the way to the bottom. This is going to try to secure the spinal cord, trying to prevent it from moving from side to side kind of thing. This diagram on the right, I wanted to represent the different sorts of meninges. So we've got some coverings for the spinal cord. So the one that's most adherent to the spinal cord itself is going to be called the pia mater. So that's the one just pretty much on the pia mater. Now, above that, as you can see, that white structure over here, that's going to be called our arachnoid, um, arachnoid meninges. So here we've got arachnoid meninges, and then you've got these web-like structures called arachnoid trabeculations. This kind of looks like a web, and that kind of gives like arachnoid spider sort of thing. So it gives off that kind of impression. So between below the arachnoid space and above the pia mater is where our CSF fluid is going to be traveling in. Some of our CSF is also going to go through our central canal in the middle of that spinal cord. So what's above that arachnoid, um, uh, arachnoid meninges? We've got our dura mater, and this is going to be called dura mater, our spinal dural sheath. Above the dura mater, we've got our epidural space, and this can contain fat as well. Um, very, these spaces are important to know because you can actually give therapeutic intervention. So if we're giving analgesia to a localized area, we can choose to go in through to the epidural space to give anesthetics. Very common in obstetrics on so pregnancy, you can actually get, give epidural anesthetics to give pain relief for labor. All right, now we'll talk about our meninges, which is our last part. So this is our covering. So I've already talked a little bit about our covering about the spinal cord. The covering of the brain is slightly different. So let's talk about our skin. Let's talk about our legs. We've got our skin. Underneath that, we've got our periosteum. Then after that, we've got our bone. So this is our skull bones. Then we've got two types of dura mater. We've got our periosteal layer, which is kind of right next to the, um, the bone. It's going to just travel with the bone. And then we've got our meningeal dura mater. As you can see, it's, it separates at times. What's under the dura mater, just like the spinal cord, you're going to have arachnoid mater. After the arachnoid mater, you can have the arachnoid villi or the trabeculations, as you see. It looks like a spider-like structure. And then we've got blood vessels, CSF fluid, as we talked about before. And then finally, we've got what's adherent to the brain itself, just like the spinal cord. It's going to be our pia mater. So now, here, what something interesting we can notice, can you see here's our CSF fluid that's going to be sitting? What's this? Our arachnoid villi. Remember, we talked about our ventricular system and how it's connecting with our superior sagittal sinus. 
that's it. So it's going to be, this is where the CSF can exchange and leave the system as well into a superior sagittal sinus. Um, and other important things to note is you can have, so, so the PMR is very kind of adherent to the brain. While there are potential, there is a definite space between the arachnoid and PMR. So that's physiological. However, if you have, um, let's say, um, uh, some sort of potential space that, so there's a potential space between the arachnoid and the dura mater. If there is maybe a rupture or bleeding of some sort due to trauma, so a very common way for bleeding to happen underneath the dural um, meninges is there's something called bridging veins. So bridging veins are veins that are draining into our superior sagittal sinus that becomes ruptured due to acceleration or deceleration or any similar sorts of injuries. Um, and what that can do is that tear of that venous um, system, venous veins, those bridging veins can lead to enlargement of these potential space. And these are pathologic. When you have a potential space above your dura mater that starts to bleed, like a very common example is the middle meningeal artery, which can um, rupture with trauma or get injured or lacerated. And once it starts opening up that space, that can be called epidural uh, bleed. And that's another potential and pathological space as well. So these are some clinical um, importance. Now, another thing that we should note about is why is there one dura mater in the spinal cord, but there is two in the brain? Well, think about it this way. I think about it like there's two that comes down that lines the brain. There's always meant to be two. But once it reaches here, we've got before it goes to our spinal cord, the foramen magnum, one part of the dura mater will continue with the spinal cord. And that's why we've got that one. The other one would actually fold upwards and continue with the top of the bone. And this gives rise to the periosteum that we see over here. I think, so that concludes our overview of the central nervous system anatomy. I hope that was helpful. And I know that this doesn't cover everything in central nervous system anatomy, but if there's any other topics or anything more in central nervous system that you'd like me to cover, please comment down. Don't forget to subscribe and like, and I guess I'll see you guys next session. All right, thank you for watching. Bye.